the booktube. So today we are talking about Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom by Leigh Bardugo. I read these two books as part of my 2017 booktube SFF Awards TBR. So Crooked Kingdom has been nominated in the YA category and obviously it's the second book in a duology so I had to read Six of Crows first. Now I know I'm pretty late to this game. <laughs> A lot of people have been reading these two books and really loving them. And before that, a lot of people have read Lee Bardugo's main Grisha trilogy and really loved it too. I came into Six of Crows having read nothing before. Um, I've been meaning to pick up the Grisha trilogy, but I just, I, I've had so many other trilogies and series and standalone books. It just, it's been really low down on my TBR, so I haven't gotten around to it. However, I've heard from a lot of I had heard from a lot of people that you didn't need to read the main Grisha books to jump into Six of Crows. And that's really true. I think if you've never read any of Leigh Bardugo's Grisha novels, but you want to start reading her work, I think Six of Crows is a perfectly good place to start. It certainly inspired me to bump the Grisha trilogy up much higher on my TBR. I gave both books in this duology 4.75 stars I think like they were really close to being five star reads maybe even five star reads like I really liked them and I wouldn't even say that necessarily that I liked one more than the other I liked both of them both of them had a few things in them that I that weren't perfect for me but overall they were just they were so enjoyable this is probably redundant but basically for those of you who don't know six of crows is about six dangerous outcasts who will have a chance to make their fortunes in the Grisha universe. All they have to do is the impossible. There are crows outside my window. I don't know if that's um, audible. If it is, I apologize. Six criminals with diverse motivations and backgrounds come together to pull off an insane heist. Steal a scientist back from a radical government in the middle of an impregnable fortress and get home without being double-crossed. I heard I think an interview with Lee Bardugo saying that she was kind of inspired by Ocean's Eleven and that's very very clear. Not that, not that it, this is like a weird fantasy Ocean's Eleven retelling but you can definitely see like it's got all of those heisty, those are some like really loud crows, the heisty elements and kind of revenge and money and it's just it's great it's really great so the first book deals with the heist and the second book deals with uh, basically everything that comes after the heist because of course as much as things seem to go right something always goes wrong you know I don't I don't want to give it I'm really trying to be not spoilery in this review okay so let's talk about a couple things that I really loved about these books first of all the writing so if you've been watching my channel, you, you may have seen I've been kind of dipping my toe into the YA genre. I don't really read it. But since I've been trying to read some YA, like mostly fantasy, yeah, mostly fantasy YA because I love fantasy, I have not had a great experience with it. Thus far, you know, I, I've tried Cassandra Clare. I've tried Sarah J. Mass. I tried reading the new release of Fire and Stars. Didn't care for any of them. Cassandra Clare I could get through, but it wasn't a particularly pleasurable experience. <sighs> you know, I've really been struggling with, is this just what YA is? So I went into Six of Crows trepidatious, let's just say that. And I was really thrilled to discover that, yeah, there is really good, like not just fun or entertaining, but like legitimately well-written YA out there. So that's my number one check mark on both of these books is that they're actually quite well written. Lee Bardugo has put in a lot of effort to hone her her writer's voice, her skill, like it's, it's on display and that's fantastic. What follows is really good characters and a fun enjoyable plot. This is definitely a very plot and character driven story. If you like fantasy and you like heists, it's it'll be really easy to just like get sucked in and disappear into this world. I read both of these books very quickly. One of the things I loved is the characters. I really liked all of the characters. Matthias is definitely my least favorite character, but I I, st I actually, but he grew. He grew so much between the end of this, the first book and the end of the second book. Like he, his character, he had such a, 
a good character arc that I grew to like him. So I appreciate that. And then the rest of the characters were just so much fun. Like, I just loved them all. And I was really rooting for them. And I was rooting for their relationships. Like, even though they're not necessarily great people, they were just interesting. They were fascinating. And I liked, I appreciated the way Lee Bardugo interwove their backstories into the narrative. Like, their histories were spooled out to us in, in drips and drabs. Like, I don't think we actually get some f solid information about Kaz's background until halfway through the first book. And so it, it just leaves you like you're really you, you keep turning those pages because you just want to know how these characters ended up where they ended up. Another thing I thought was great is that for a YA novel this this book is a little hmm, trope busting. Okay, so it's really common in YA to have the kind of destiny trope where you have these people, this character, these protagonists, it can even be multiple protagonists. And a lot of times they will start out kind of at the bottom, but then there will be a, a triggering incident that will show them their destiny and they're fated to do something or they're going to overthrow the government or something. The variations on those kind of constructs are really common. And something I thought was really great about this duology is that that never happens. <laughs> like these six characters do not have a bigger destiny. They're poor, they're outcasts, they're disowned, they're anti-heroes. Some of them have disabilities. They are the, on the fringes of their society and they don't have some big prophesied destiny waiting for them. You know, they're not gonna become a princess or a prince or a major general, they're not gonna be like a long lost princess or something. Like, <laughs> you know, that does not occur at all. They have no higher destiny. They really are just trying to eke out their own survival. And I think that's really interesting. It's interesting to read. It's interesting to see play out. It makes them fascinating characters to follow. And it, it kind of, you know, it turns expectations of what you expect to happen in a YA a little on their head and I appreciate that. I think the only thing I really that really didn't jive with me and this happened in the first and second books is that okay so in Ocean's Eleven we know that there are certain pieces of information that are withheld from the audience by the we'll call it the writer it's the writer slash the director in film right there are pieces of information withheld specifically so that the audience can't guess what's the solution to the heist is going to be. And that occurs in Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom. <laughs> They're like, a lot of information is given to the reader as though we're being handed all the little pieces to figure the, the solution to the heist. I mean, like, it's not a solution, but like the way the heist is gonna fit together. But then you get to the end and there's always some huge thing that's been purposely withheld so that we're surprised. And that was a little annoying. I didn't feel deceived by the characters, which I think I would have found more interesting. I felt deceived by the writer because it was a narrative device. Like you, it was the author playing puppet master a little bit with you so that you're shocked at the end. And it's not entirely genuine and it felt manipulative and it just irked me a little bit because I'd kind of get to the, the reveal, if you want to call it that, and it'd just be like, oh, okay, so you, specifically left out huge portions of information. I, I don't know, it, it's difficult to explain. So something sort of similar happens, for example, this is a weird example, but in the Maltese Falcon, uh, the protagonist will make a phone call that, and you'll be told that he's making a phone call, but you won't be privy to what he's saying. He'll just, you know, he'll have the phone call and he'll hang up and he'll go somewhere or he'll like run an errand and you, you're told that he's running this errand, but you're not told why. And so you know that things are being withheld from you, but like, it's like the author is giving you a glimpse into what's being held so that maybe if you're really clever, you'll figure it out. But we're not given any of those little moments in these books. They're just totally not on the page, not foreshadowed or anything. And so you really just feel manipulated without ever having been given the opportunity to figure it, figure it out. Does, I don't feel like I'm explaining this very well, but hopefully that kind of makes sense. It's not a big deal. 
Like it really didn't detract that much from my overall enjoyment. I think I found it more irritating in the first book because I like to figure out the endings of books before I get to them. Matt. Sorry. If they're kind of if there's a puzzle involved, I, I like trying to figure it out myself. I knew to expect it going into the second book, right? And so he knew it was coming. It's like my only beef and it's really small and it didn't detract from my overall enjoyment. But that's kind of why I gave the books 4.75 stars instead of 5 stars. Like if I felt like I'd had a fair shot of figuring out the twist, I probably would have given them 5, but I didn't feel like I did. I don't think that will bother a lot of people. Oh, the other thing that bugged me, and obviously it's a YA book, which means all of the characters have to be like under 18 or 18 and under. So like the entire crew is 15 or 16 to 18 is the oldest one and I didn't buy it at all <laughs> like oh my god really I mean and I think this is just like my age stuff takes time to accomplish in the real world rebuilding stuff like rebuilding a harbor takes time especially in a not very industrialized society or, or time period there there's there are suspensions of dis disbelief that go along with having such young characters, having accomplished so much in essentially two years, or three years max, that you're just like, mm, okay, <laughs> sure. Also, a couple of the characters just, they don't act like they're teenagers to me. They really, I really thought Matthias was like late 20s before he was given an age like late 20s early 30s because that's just how he acted <laughs> like I Inez and Wyland I could realistically believe were their ages the rest of them I really couldn't and that's just me and that's just a problem I'm gonna have with YA in general I think I just so that being said and that's what reminded me of this I think you'll really like this if you like YA I suggested this book to a friend of mine because I think the plot and the genre she would love but it's YA and she hates reading YA just because she has an even harder time with the whole teenage aspect than I do. She was like nah not for me so you have to like YA. You like you need to like fantasy. I think I have a feeling that if you like Bardugo's other books you'll really like these books. If you've never read her books it's totally f doable. I wasn't I didn't feel lost in the, the world at all picking up here. However, one caveat to that, if you've not read her main trilogy and you want to read her main trilogy, be forewarned that there is one small but like, I'm pretty sure major like huge spoiler for book three of her Christian trilogy. Very, very casually offhanded mention in this. And I was like reading it going, oh, wait, I recognize that name. Oh, 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 well, I I, I think I haven't like gone out and checked because I, I would prefer not to be spoiled, but I'm pretty sure I know how book three of her original trilogy ends now. You might not notice it. You might, it's my only caveat to reading it before you read the main trilogy. If you like heist stories, I think you'll really enjoy this. I think you'll enjoy both because both of them center around heists and stealing stuff and that's really fun. Another thing that this world, like the world of Ketterdam or the city of Ketterdam really reminded me of was Ankh-Morpork. The book's not at all like Discworld, but I think if you kind of like maybe going postal, I can't remember, um, Grimes, the police, novels in Discworld. So like The Fifth Elephant, Guards Guards, those ones. If you liked those ones, you like kind of the, the world in those, I think you might enjoy this. The, these, these books aren't funny and they're not satires, but there's a, there's a, they have similar aesthetics, senses, sensibilities. So yeah, really liked these two books. Definitely understand why Crooked Kingdom was nominated. This Savage Song is the other book I have to read for the YA category. And I gotta say, it's gonna have to be really good to win my vote because right now Crooked Kingdom is just really glad I read it. Anyways, thanks for watching this review. If you've read either of these books, let me know what you thought about them down in the comments. If you're thinking about reading them, I'd love to know that too. Let me know if you like these kind of individual book reviews or if you find them at all helpful so I know whether I should keep doing them or not. And I'll see you guys all in my next video. Bye.